Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here in my alma mater. I actually did my uh, diploma study, uh, studies here, uh, and uh, it's really nice to be back. I'm going to be giving a talk in English. Uh, the excuse is that there are probably people in the audience who don't know English, but it's also uh, much easier for me uh, to speak about this in English, although I have maintained my Finnish as well. And uh, one important thing right out of the gate is that uh, do ask questions along the way, so I don't want to wait till the end for questions. Let's keep it interactive like yesterday. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about one of the projects that we've been doing uh, since about uh, 2005 in my lab called uh, Kidney Exchanges. And uh, it's a very exciting uh, topic in my mind, very helpful uh, in practice. And, and uh, um, I know that Finland is kind of um, more advanced in recycling than the US is, and this is kind of the ultimate of recycling, we kind of recycling people. Okay, um, so first I'd like to start with a word of uh, thank you uh, to my collaborators, and in particular in this talk I'm going to be uh, picking some results from 40, five different papers, and uh, you can see the collaborators there, including my PhD students and uh, other professors in computer science, some economists, some medical people, and so forth. Um, of note here is that uh, I'm very proud of one of my co-workers, Al Roth, here, on one of these papers actually got the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, two weeks ago. Okay, um, so let's just continue. So, um, kidney disease is a disease that really um, cuts across segments of society. So, for, it's both in developed worlds, developing worlds, it cuts across uh, races, and so on. So this is really an issue in every country. So far, we've mostly been working in the U.S., so I'm going to be talking about the U.S. market. And, but the laws are similar in many countries, so I'll highlight some differences. In the U.S. alone, over 50,000 people a year get lethal kidney disease. And uh, the traditional treatment is dialysis. And if you don't know what that means, it means that uh, you get hooked up to a machine that will filter your blood. Uh, Quality of life on dialysis is very low though. So uh, you go to a dialysis center for multiple hours at a time, multiple times a week. And for healthy people, it's uh, rather hard to actually understand how low the quality of life really is. But an indication of that is that while in theory you could be stretched out forever on dialysis, in practice, most people actually discontinue treatment and decide to die instead. Only 12% survive 10 years. Um, a more permanent solution is a transplant, and uh, you can take a kidney out of somebody else, a dead person or a live person, and put it into one of these people, and they can live fine with one. Uh, the trickiness here is that uh, you have to be compatible for blood type, tissue type, and certain other factors. And why are we looking at kidneys? Well, kidneys are by far the most prevalent organ transplant, more prevalent than all other organ transplants combined. There's a national waiting list uh, for cadaveric kidneys, dead people's kidneys in the US, and it's 94,000 people long. And the average wait time is two to five years, depending on your blood type. About 5,000 people die on the wait list per year. Uh, about 34,000 get, get added to the list every year. And about 11,000 get a deceased donor kidney. And about 6,000 get a live donor kidney. A live donor means that somebody is willing to give you one of their kidneys so that you can both live fine. But you can see here there's a big imbalance of supply and demand, and the queue just keeps growing and growing. So um, that's kind of where our work comes in. In um, live donation, you, uh, you realize that you only need one kidney to survive, and you can keep the other one away, and it'll both be fine. And, uh, in the US and most other countries, it's illegal to buy or sell organs. So we cannot, for example, have an auction and try to source kidneys for the needy ones by just paying people to donate organs. And I'm not saying whether that's a good or bad thing, that's a reality and that's our starting point. Iran, by the way, is an opposite of that. They actually allow uh, money-based organ transfer now. Um, but even without money, you could have family members or friends or your favorite computer science colleague 
give you a kidney if you need one. Uh, the trickiness there is that chances are that they're incompatible, either due to blood type, tissue type, or a few other factors. And that's where kidney exchange comes in. And kidney exchange is an idea introduced by Stephen Woodall, one of my collaborators, in 1986. This is way before we got involved. But in reality, it started happening around 2003. The idea is that you have these willing but incompatible pairs. Each pair has a patient who needs a kidney and a donor who's willing to give a kidney, but only if their patient's patient receives one. So uh, we'll denote the pair by a circle, and it has a patient and a donor inside. So let's say we have pair one that's willing but incompatible, and you have another pair that's also willing but incompatible. The simplest form of the idea here is now we can have the pairs swap their donors. So a donor one gives to patient two, donor two gives to patient one, and everybody can live. That's our idea at its most basic form. And we call this a two cycle because in the solution there's a cycle and there are two pairs in the cycle. Any questions so far? No. Usually we have the kidneys travel inside the donors. So we actually have the donors fly to the uh, place where this, that particular surgery is going to take place. Uh, sometimes we also ship them on ice. Okay, so for now, uh, bringing it into computer science or optimization, uh, what we have here, once we aggregate all of these willing but incompatible pairs into a pool, we have this kind of an input graph, which is a directed graph, where the nodes are pairs, and each edge, each arrow, denotes a compatibility. So for example here, uh, this guy can give a kidney to this guy, this guy can give a kidney to this guy, and so forth, but uh, this guy can't give a kidney to this guy, and so forth. So uh, the objective here is to find a maximum weight combination of these joint cycles. So we're not looking for a cycle, a something good thing. That's not the combinatorial problem, that's the easy part. We are looking for a combination of cycles so that we get maximum weight. Um, and here, one solution would be that we could take cycle 1, C1, and cycle... Do you take into account the fact that this V3 can actually would be compatible with V2 as well as V3? So, so it, does, it doesn't have to be so that you have all, only this one-to-one -one connection. So, so a donor can actually provide more, many parties of the same thing, but when you do the optimization, you should have that in your graph. Sorry, I didn't answer the question. <coughs> so, when you have a donor link from v, V4 to V3, okay, that's the single link E6, e but it may very well be that you could have a link, a, a kind of a compatibility of a donor for V4 to V2, or V1. So Yes, yes, and, and you can see, for example, V4 okay. is compatible with this guy and this guy. Yes. So, so one donor is typically compatible with multiple recipients. And that's already shown in this graph. And this particular graph is a tiny example, just to show you the idea. In reality, the projected size of the US wide kidney exchange when it's fully in steady state is 10,000 pairs. I just didn't want to show it right there. Right now, our pools are about 150. So here, this is a tiny example just for illustration purposes. But this already shows that uh, the trickiness is that there are multiple compatibilities from a given donor, and when we decide who we're going to give this guy to, this guy, this guy, or nobody, that's going to have implications on the other possible cycles. That's where the combinatorics kicks in. Uh, we want to find a combination of cycles, but they have to be disjoint, in that any cycles that we choose, they cannot overlap in nodes. Why? You can't take more than one kidney out of a donor, otherwise they will die. Like, are these the weights and what? These are edges. Okay. And so, first I'm going to present this as if all the edges are the same, weight one. Then, later in the talk, I'm going to say, no, they have different weights. But let's, let's first stay with all weights being the same. Good question. Any other questions? Okay. 
So, uh, one, one question. Are you going to treat short cycles the same as long? No. No, uh, we, we're going to get to that. Ad nauseum. So, in the current graph, uh, this is not a solution, right? This is not a solution. This is a problem. This is the input to the algorithm. This is not the algorithm. But I mean, there are not, uh, there are two edges going out of these four. So in yes, that, in that this, this is showing all of the compatibilities, and we have to, from this input, we have to find our output is going to be a collection of cycles that are disjoint. Good. Any other question? About the landscape of the cadavers. Yes. The cadaver, uh, in my view, everything should be optimized together, of course, because I'm an optimist. But uh, the reality is that the disease to our waiting list is not optimized at all. It is dispatched using policy-driven dispatch rules, and it's not part of this system. It's a completely separate system. And one of the reasons, it's not just political, one of the reasons is that the cadaveric kidneys have to be dispatched very quickly. Because when somebody dies, the kidney starts to go bad. Death is bad for your organs. And, and here, we have time to wait and optimize. But if somebody's dead, you don't have time to wait. You have to just dispatch, preferably in your local region. Uh, the cadaver kidneys are not going to be part of this at all. You'll see some of these other considerations come in as a waste. Yeah. So that was, shouldn't, shouldn't that appear as a certain types of cycles depending on compatibilities being more desirable than others because the cadaver can supply that sort of different? Uh, yeah, well, uh, we'll talk about weights later in the talk. But short answer is yes, there will be weights. Oh. Yeah. All right. Uh, so far as I've talked about it, it's actually the problem is the same as in any barter exchange. There's nothing special about the kidneys as presented so far. And there was a barter exchange, for example, for holiday homes called Intermac. You can exchange swap holiday weeks with other people. Uh, there's one for books called Read It, Swap It. You read it, you swap it. Uh, there's one called NetCycler, who just bought swap.com in the US. I've been actually a consultant for them, that's for general and use books. Uh, actually, a Finnish farming company. Uh, the funniest that I know is the National Horseshoe Exchange. This is for people like leg amputees or people who have different sized feet. They will uh, potentially have their shoe buying costs by swapping. This is, uh, I'm, I'm serious, this does exist. Uh, what, what makes uh, organ exchange, kidney exchange, uh, special, although this to some extent also occurs at NetCycle or another swapping exchanges, is that the transplants in a, within a cycle, not across cycles, but within a cycle, have to occur simultaneously. Why? Well, if we did a cycle and did it one leg at a time, then once my recipient has already received a kidney, I might say, okay, I have second thoughts, I'm not going to give a kidney. And somebody else is now out the kidney. So what happens instead is that um, the surgeons are on cell phones with each other across the country within a cycle saying, I am pulling the kidney out now. It's not even when the patients go under for the anesthesia, it's actually when they take out the kidney. So nobody can be pulled out of the operating room uh, and back up. So they really are atomic in a computer science sense. Um, that need for simultaneity also begets logistical problems. We have to have all of the operating rooms for a cycle available at the same time. The surgeons, the anesthesiologists, the nurses, the whole kit. And remember that these don't just occur in one transplant center. For example, in the Junos Exchange, where we are the decision-making engine, we have 121 transplant centers across the US. So it's a logistical nightmare. Therefore, we have a preference for short cycles. We don't want a cycle that's 100 long. Two cycles is good, three cycles is pretty good. The longest cycle that has actually been ever executed is a six cycle. But that was more like a stunt, and it's rare. Uh, um, another reason why we prefer short cycles is that the cycle may fail to exchange. Uh, there are two main reasons for this. One is that the patients might get sick at the last minute. And if uh, uh, somebody gets sick for some reason and can't go in the transplant, the whole cycle fails. So in a short cycle, the chance that somebody's going to get sick is smaller, and if they do, fewer people are affected. And the other reason is that medical knowledge is incomplete. I showed you the input graph, but 
But in reality, many of those edges in the input graph are fake. And we'll find out just a week or two before operation by mixing the bloods together. We we'll take the donors and the plant uh, patient's bloods, we mix them together and they coagulate. If they cake, we can't go ahead with the operation after all, the edge phase. And medical knowledge is incomplete, so by just looking at this guy's blood separately from this guy's blood, we can't tell. For sure. Sometimes we can tell in advance, okay, these are different blood types or different tissue types, definitely not compatible. But if the medical knowledge is that they are compatible, they may or may not be. All right. And in the UNIS is a United Network for Organ Sharing, which controls all the transplantation in the US. Uh, we are the decision making engine for that. So uh, our optimizer runs every week there and decides the transplant plan for the US. Uh, there, the cycle length cap is three. So we do two cycles and three cycles. No longer for these students. Okay, so let's talk about the problem of complexity. Uh, it was actually an open problem as to whether this is entry complete, and uh, it turns out it is for any cycle length cap of three or more, as we proved. So if you have the real problem, you're looking at an entry complete problem. If, on the other hand, you have a problem where there's just two cycles, you can solve this in polynomial time. And similarly, if you allow arbitrarily long cycles, you can again solve this in polynomial time. So unfortunately, it is exactly the real problems that are the entry problems. Um, now I'm going to delve into a little bit more detail into the algorithm. And if you're not a computer scientist, for a few slides you might want to zone off. Uh, and then we're going to come back and talk more about uh, uh, other aspects of the design. But the high level point is that our algorithm finds the probably optimal solution. So there's no other solution that gives you a higher weight solution of these joint sites. What, was, uh, what happened before us? So kidney exchange started before we started, uh, a couple of years before, and what was done before us? Uh, well, one was manual matching. So you have some surgeons in the back room trying to see the compatibilities and trying to figure out some cycles. Uh, or greedy algorithms. Uh, they don't find an optimal solution and the manual approach doesn't scale. Secondly, you could use, uh, if you allow just two cycles, you can use maximum weight matching like Edelman's algorithm and get an optimal solution. But it doesn't support longer than two cycles, doesn't support change, which I'm going to talk about later, doesn't support side constraints, which I'm going to uh, talk about later, and so on. This was actually what they were doing at Johns Hopkins University that was a local exchange until uh, fairly recently. And the third one was uh, using a general purpose integer program, uh, solver, typically CPLEX. Uh, it has all of the same functionality as our algorithm, but it doesn't scale. So it runs out of memory at about 600 to 900 patients, while the projected size of the US kidney exchange steady state will be 10,000. So it's not even close. Okay, um, the, uh, the algorithm. And the uh, market design ideas I'm going to talk about uh, are being used for real. So most importantly, the United Network for Organ Share in UNIS, which uh, controls all of the transplantation in the US, uh, set up a nationwide kidney exchange uh, in October 2010. We started from nothing. And uh, today, we have 121 transplant centers as part of the network. Uh, and we conduct the weekly matches. So our software is installed at the UNIS headquarters in Richmond. Uh, people are entering their data on the web, and the uh, optimization button is pressed every week and it makes a transplantation plan for the US. There were two earlier kidney exchanges which were regional, the Alliance for Pay Donation and the Pay Donation Network. We've actually worked with both of them um, to do some runs with them. Nowadays, the Pay Donation Network no longer exists, and the Alliance for Pair Donation is one of the four major transplant centers, the kind of partner transplant centers in the UNOS kidney exchange. So they will be pairs there as well, although they also put on global ones. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the algorithm. And then I'm going to pop back. So if you follow the wagon, don't leave. Uh, I'm saying the second generation algorithm, the first algorithm that we tried had the following formulation. We had a variable for every edge, and it was binary. 
it was zero if we didn't pick the edge, one if we did pick the edge, and then we would generate dynamically constraints to make sure that the solution is a sol uh, collection of these joint cycles. But that didn't scale. So I'm going to just jump straight into the second generation algorithm, which is not based on constraint generation, it's based on branch at price, which is a generalization of column generation into integer programming. And, uh, and then we added a lot of uh, custom things on top of that to make it fast. Okay, so here's the formulation for it. First of all, this is not the algorithm, this is a formulation. We have a uh, set of capital C of cycles of length that's not too long, so in our case, three, uh, two cycles and three cycles. We have a variable for each cycle. Uh, variable takes value one if we select the cycle and zero if we don't. Then we have a, uh, the objective is just to maximize uh, the sum of the weights of the accepted cycles, subject to the constraint that we don't take more than one kidney out of anybody. So this is the disjointedness uh, constraint here. And again, uh, all of the variables have to be 0 or 1. You can't take 0.72 of a kidney out. You have to take it out or not take it out. Any questions on this? Is there a difference between left and right kidney? Ah, good. Uh, we don't need to model that. But typically, I don't remember which it is, but typically the surgeons prefer to take out one or the other. I don't remember which it is. But it's irrelevant here because uh, we are going to take out only one. So it's kind of a surgeon's post processor when they decide which one to take out. Okay. Um, some of you may know our work on combinatorial auctions and combinatorial auction unit determination, which is also NP complete. Uh, this is very different in the sense that in combinatorial auction unit determination, you run out of time first. Here you run out of memory first, even on supercomputers. So um, the problem is too large to write down because there are too many variables in the model, too many columns. Therefore, what we need to do is to find a probably optimal solution to a problem that we can't write down. Sounds like an oxymoron, but it's actually possible in the fraction price paradigm, which is the paradigm from operations research. Uh, the idea is that we generate the search tree uh, where we pick some variable to branch on the left branches that we accept it, the right branches that we don't. And then in the children of the tree, you pick another bar uh, variable on the other side of the branch, and so forth. That would give you a search tree that's bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. So way too big to have in memory, or even implicitly in memory. So uh, what you do, you prove the search tree by saying, that, okay, some of these paths are not promising. Probably not promising, and therefore don't need to be considered. And that's called fathoming. We uh, fathom the search node if it's no bigger than the best, no more promising than the best incumbent. And what does promising mean? Well, we can solve the linear problem in relaxation, at least in concept, uh, and say, okay, if we have the decisions we made on the path, on those variables, and for the remaining problem, we allow you to, allow you to take kidneys out fractionally. So now you could take 0.72 of a kidney out. We get an upper bound on how promising the path is, and that's what we do. But now the problem is we can't write the linear problem down. It's too big. That's where the column generation comes in. Okay, uh, so at every node of the search tree, the master linear problem, which we call P, has too many variables. So it won't fit into memory, and even if it did, uh, it would take too long to solve. So we begin with a restricted linear problem, P prime which contains only a small subset of the variables, i.e. a small set of the cycles, and of course then we have that the optimum to the small set is no more valuable than the optimum to the real problem. So what we do, we solve P prime, and if necessary, we add more variables to it. And we repeat until we are probably optimal for that node of the search tree, and then the search continues. That's the main idea. Any questions on the basic idea? Okay. Um, the, the, now the question is, which variables do we need to bring into the model? And we, we define the price of the cycle. This is not the dollar price or anything for kidneys. This is uh, just the concept, conceptual price for the average uh, purpose. 
you say the price is the weight of the cycle minus the sum of the linear program in dual values of the nodes that are part of the cycle. And we have to bring in only cycles of positive price, because the cycles that have negative price, you can actually show that there's no way they can improve your solution. Um, so the key is to check the price of cycles one by one without having the cycles in memory, and you only bring in the cycles that have positive price, or some of them. Um, okay, so there are some techniques how we can quickly generate those positive price cycles. I'm going to skip that. Uh, short of it is that normally in branch and price we might need to solve a whole integer program to determine what those cycles are. Here we have special purpose tools, so we can actually uh, do this in low order polynomial time. So we're fortunate. Okay. The other problem, and, or another problem here, is that um, while we could prove that we have optimality for that node of the search tree, once all the remaining codes that are not in the model have non-positive price, there is what's known as a tailing off effect. Like we are bringing in more and more positive price cycles, while in reality we are already at optimal. We just don't know. And there is in general no solution to this, but we have an application specific solution here. Um, and uh, this is what it is. Uh, we can relax the cycle length constraint. This gives a polynomial time upper bound, as I said, we can solve that problem in polynomial time with the long cycles. And if uh, the optimal solution with the restricted linear program is as good as this upper bound, then we know that we don't have to bring in more cycles. So that's an early stop, uh, which is what we want. Then called seeding, the pricing problem is actually really expensive, and it's the most expensive part of the whole algorithm computationally, so uh, we don't want to start it from scratch, start it from nothing. So we actually uh, generate heuristically good columns, think the cycles that we think are good, might be promising, we put them in, and then we put in a large number of randomly selected cycles as well, just so we don't have to uh, do during this uh, column genera uh, uh, cycle generation over and over. Then sometimes um, we run out of memory anyway, there are just too many columns in the model still, so now we have to delete columns. And what we do is that um, uh, we delete the column with the largest negative price first, and the motivation for this is that it's the most satisfied constraint in the dual, and it is okay, because if we are making a mistake, if it actually is part of the optimal solution and we throw it away, our column generation is going to automatically regenerate it later. Okay, any questions so far? I have a couple more slides on the algorithm and then we're going to bump back at the high level. Yes. I have one issue about the easy to graph. So yes. Does it have strongly connected components? Is it, is it just one big component? Just one big component. Other questions? So, how fast is it? How well? sensitive is the uh, kind of the compatibility between people? So if V1 is uh, compatible with V2, so how how compatible is V1 with V3 if V2 is compatible with V3? No kind of big deal like that. So 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 they're totally the edges are totally independent in essence. Other questions? Yeah. So, can we discuss the problem of uh, bigger than two caps now or at the end of the problem? Bigger than two cap? Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm talking about. The uh, uh, case with a cap that may be bigger than two. Okay. In particular, we are with three right now. Yes, sir. So this is all about that. Thank you, complete problem. I, I wasn't going to give you the algorithms for the case with a cap of two or the cap of infinity. I have the slides for that if you want. We can take it offline later and talk through that. But I'm, I'm just talking about the main algorithm that solves the real problem, not the polynomial cap cases. Okay. Um, Another uh, idea here is that um, we can prune the search more if we find good solutions early on in the tree. And the idea here is that we're going to construct an integral solution from the frac fractional linear program solution at the node in various ways, and that's going to give us lower bounds. Um, that's going to help prune the tree later. One is kind of a rounding heuristic, which includes all of the cycles with the linear program value greater than half, 
and greedy put in the remaining cycles. Uh, that's kind of a straightforward idea, and it doesn't work. It doesn't speed up things. Um, another thing that actually significantly helps is that uh, we use CPLEX as a primary heuristic at the nodes, but only on the restricted FIOP, the interlinear program that corresponds to the columns that we've already generated. So we can actually solve the integer version of the restricted LP, and that actually gives us good lower bounds. There are other tricks on this as well. We have a time limit on it, so if that right now heuristic isn't uh, giving you solutions quickly, we can skip it if everything is still correct. And we only do this if the node is sufficiently different from the parent, so we don't basically pay almost the same computation over and over. Um, there's a limit that the uh, uh, IOP value has to match a fractional target. If it doesn't, then we don't have to continue that at all. Okay, so now this is kind of the bottom line on the algorithm here. So now I would kind of come back to the wagon if you didn't follow, if you're not a computer scientist. Here on the x-axis I have the number of patients uh, using a simulator, the best simulator by Simon and Paul. Um, and uh, it has to be simulated because kidney exchanges today aren't this big. Uh, the steady state projected uh, for the US is 10,000 pairs, but we are of course not there yet. Um, so that's why we made the x-axis go to 10,000. On the y-axis I have clearing time, how long does it take to find and prove optimality? And here's CPLEX, uh, as I mentioned, depending on the problem instance, it runs out of memory at 600 to 900. And here is our algorithm, and we can solve the whole problem in uh, uh, less than an hour. And these other things here are our algorithm with some of the techniques turned off, so we can actually see the relative contributions of the different techniques. Okay, so uh, the computational problem was a big bottleneck for building a nationwide kidney exchange, and then when we came up with the algorithm, Yunus actually had a competition where they asked all possible vendors to make, make proposals, and then they selected this for the kidney exchange uh, in 2008, and in 2010 we went live with Yunus, and we've been running with them ever since. So uh, if you don't in the follow that, uh, the short of it is that the algorithm requires a global optimal solution. It has a lot of heuristic techniques to make it faster, but they don't compromise optimality. Okay. So now I'm going to pop up to additional functionality for modern kidney exchanges that our algorithm supports. One is multiple willing donors per patient. So if you're a nice guy, maybe more than one of your computer science colleagues is willing to give you a kidney. And you don't have to ask all of them are given. You say, okay, well, as long as one of you gets, uh, gives, it's, it's good enough. I get to participate. But they can all participate, and we can simply add these edges from corresponding to their compatibility into the graph, and then the solver is automatically going to use all of them as possible donors, and as a post processor, we can just see which one of them was actually used in the solution. So you're going to end up using only one of them, but you have a better chance or finding a match if you have more donors because you have more edges. Any questions on that? Second, incorporating compatible pairs. And a compatible pair is one where the donor would give to their own recipient. And most of the time, they will just do the transplant. Why would they ever come to the kidney exchange? They're good people. Good people, other reasons. Ah, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> it might yield better matches for you. So, for example, at the Alliance for Fair Donation, we had a situation where there was a 13 year old girl that was legally sick, very sick, and didn't have a lot of time. And they had maybe a 60 year old uncle or father or something like that willing to give. Everybody knew that that older person's kidney would not last a lifetime in the child. So we actually said, that, okay, participate in the kidney exchange. We might find you something younger. And they did, and they gave us a limit that if in three months you can do it, we'll wait. But after that, we're going to do it on our own. And within three months, actually much shorter than that, the girl got a much younger kidney. And the old donor actually donated to somebody who was already old in the first place. 
So there's a reason why these compatible pairs should be participating in the exchange, even if they would do the local price tag. Another reason is that there are actually degrees of compatibility. So for example, uh, there's uh, tissues like HLA. There's, at the high level, there are six different dimensions of that, and you can have different degrees of match. So even if you have somebody that's transplanted wool, it doesn't mean that that's ideal. And the less HLA compatibility there is, the less the prognosis is that the kidney will last. Is yes. this then encoded in the weights? Yes, absolutely. Ah, that's a good segue to the next slide, which is weights. Before that, so, okay. so, so you take this data, a completely static setup of, of nodes and edges between them, and then you solve the grand problem. But presumably it takes quite a bit of time to, to enact each of these um, actual, and what I have in mind is that... that Are you a doctor? Uh, no. No, okay. Uh, um, you you well, obviously, obviously yeah. are thinking about the reality really nicely, and that's going to be my second part of my talk. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so far we're in a static study, setting, that's going to change in a moment. Okay. Um, so, weights. The algorithm supports weights on the edges, so not all of the edges have, edges have to have weight one, they can have different edges. And uh, weights can represent whatever the first party who sets up the kidney exchange wants. So, for example, at the units, they represent degrees of compatibility, HLA compatibility. They, uh, they can respect, they can uh, represent projected life years. Uh, so maybe it's better to transplant into a young person rather than into, rather than into an old person, perhaps. Um, travel distance. This is one of those things that's amazing to me. Uh, some people are not willing to get on an airplane to go to a different transplant center, but they're willing to give a major order. Uh, but in any case, uh, there's some degree of niceness if you could do your transplant at your local transplant center with the doctor you know and with your family in the same city and all of that. So there can be some reference for geographic proximity. Uh, wait time. Some believe that if you waited a long time, you should be getting priority. And indeed, the universe exchange will give longer wait times a slight priority. Um, in the Unix exchange, we also believe, or I would almost say we believe, uh, at large the design committee believes that there's some value of transplanting hard to match patients now. Uh, highly sensitized patients should be prioritized. And it's not just a proxy of easier to match patients being easier to match in the future, therefore we should match the hard ones now. It's also some notion of fairness. It's hard for me to explain because I don't fully buy it myself, but uh, um, it's, it's not just a proxy for the future. And these are designed by policy committees, much like they are on um, the deceased donor wedding list. And the first prioritization scheme actually came from that, and then we've been adjusting it to make it more appropriate for kidney care donation. This actually leads to a lot of interesting ethical issues. For example, Traders between efficiency and fairness. So as, a, as an optimizer, I might come from the perspective that we want to maximize expected life years overall, and that's the goal. Uh, uh, the opposite of that is perfect fairness, like everybody should have an equal chance. But if you have highly sensitized patients and you try to make them have an equally good chance, then everybody would have a low chance. And the reality is somewhere in between. The uh, transplantation community, at least in the US, believes that the reality should be some sort of balance between efficiency and fairness. And when we make these types of value judgments on the points, it's actually interesting that on a weekly basis, then our artificial intelligence program here will actually be striking these deep philosophical questions on a daily basis, or weekly basis. So it's kind of interesting how AI is playing the role in making these type of uh, very deep judgments calls with life and death. Uh, are those weights with fixed? Or do they change, or do you have several different graphs for the same calculations? Uh, there's one graph. Uh, the weighting policy doesn't change, except infrequently when we make some change, maybe once a year, we said, okay, it might be better to do some different way. But uh, it, it, the actual graphs change monthly because of the weight time, for example. And also because people are coming into the exchange 
going out of the exchange and so on. So there is a lot of dynamics. The combination stays the same, but then the ways that you have, like, uh, in its work. Uh, yeah, it's if, if nobody comes in or out, the combination stays the same, the way it changes. But the reality is that people are coming in and out. Coming in, they're falling sick, they're finding donors, they're getting to participate, and uh, going out, they might get the transplant from the disease donor waiting list, or they might die. So it's just a linear additive way you know, of, so you don't consider it as a multi-criteria uh, How I might, I don't want to comment on how I might do it. The way it's done by UNAS policy is that edges have weight. And I'm going to actually, towards the end of the talk, I'm going to talk about the robust version where we do something better. But this is what's actually the fielded version. And then I'm going to talk about research that's gone beyond what's fielded today. All right, here's a pretty cool innovation, I think. What if there were one person in the world, or in the country of your favorite exchange, who's willing to give a kidney for nothing? Just one. Oh, one. What would that do to the poor? But for nothing, I mean that they don't expect a kidney in return. So it's like a pair without a patient, just a donor, willing to give to anybody for nothing. What would it do to the pool? Anybody? Uh, I'm not even talking about complexity yet. What, do, what does it do? Well, instead of making a chain, oh, it's a cycle, it's going to make a chain. And it doesn't need to close. And what's at the end of the chain? The kidney. At the end of the chain, there's a kidney. There's a willing donor who hasn't donated yet. We can treat that willing donor as the altruistic donor in next week's batch. Trigger another chain, and at the end of that is what? Yet another donor. And we can do that in the next, next week's batch. So it's like a paying forward scheme, a gift that keeps giving forever. And this is the idea of a never-ending altruistic donor chain. And it's, uh, it's really nice in that you can find these chains much more often than cycles because the cycle doesn't need to close. The probabilities work much nicer and it can give forever. So if you ever want to donate a kidney for nothing, don't donate it to the, the disease donor waiting list. You're going to save one life. Donating for kidney exchange with never ending others with donor chains, it saves potentially infinitely many lives. <laughs> okay. um, so, this was an idea that uh, well, we had with Michael Reese, who uh, was a surgeon running the Alliance for Pay Donation, Al Roth, and a bunch of other people in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, we started the first such chain, and this is from that chain, in 2006 with our algorithm. Um, and you can see what, it, what happened here. It kind of went across the country. Uh, the first transplant looks like it was in Arizona, and actually in 2007. Um, then Ohio, 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 Maryland, 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 North Carolina, Maryland, Maryland Ohio, and so on. And um, this became a very powerful idea, and pretty much all of the kidney exchanges adopted this. So much so that some of them just completely abandoned science and are just doing chains today. But at the UNOS exchange, we're doing both. We're doing cycles and chains. And the easy way to incorporate chains into the model is to just say that we put a phony edge from that um, final pair back into the original altruistic donor. So the altruistic donor is more or less a pair with no recipient, but having zero weight edges from everybody back into it. And we can treat them just like cycles. So now the same optimization algorithm I told you is actually going to optimize these joint cycles and change together. Okay. So you still have a limit of three cycles? No. No. We have a limit of three for cycles, but for chains, we don't have to have any limit. Why? The chain doesn't have to execute atomically. The chain can execute in pieces. And if somebody backs out, it's not a catastrophe like it would be in a cycle, because nobody's out there bargaining chip. 
Nobody's out to keep you. Okay? Fifteen. Okay. So um, we also wanted to kind of understand chains a little bit. So uh, let me give you a few results about chains. Uh, first of all, if we put a cap on the chain length, and for your question, how does it impact solution point? So let's look at the one, uh, the sort of graph on the right. Here we have the cap on chain length. So two means we have a change of length two uh, and cycles of length three. Uh, cap of nine would be change of length nine, cycles of length three, and so on. And we see that um, uh, it's a good idea in the real pool to include chains up to 30. After that, you don't say any improvement. And if you just maximize polynality, assuming all of the edges are one, uh, it's still a good idea to have chains up to length nine. Uh, then we try to understand this more theoretically what would happen in the launch. And the model here is the Typical ABO model of blood types, so there are four blood types A, B, O, and AB, and they form a, a direct basis of graph of who can, uh, who can donate to whom. And then we have tissue type compatibility modeled by some failure probability, and we say that compatibility can't be more than 40%, uh, based on tissue type, which is realistic, and then the frequencies of the blood type, different blood types are re uh, re uh, realistic order, and we have a large unweighted graph. Of the style of airbrush training, but representing the blood types and the compatibilities, honoring the blood types and the compatibilities. Then, with high probability, the graph has an efficient allocation, maybe one that saves as many patients as possible, that uses only cycles of length at most three and chains of length at most three. So, what this says is that in a random graph model, as the graph grows, we probably do one short cycles and short chains together suffice. But what about the reality? We just saw we need long ones. So what gives? And um, we would say maybe it's a difference between unweighted and weighted. The reality is weighted. The theorem was unweighted. No, that's not the only reason. We saw that even without weights, cycles, sorry, chains up to nine help. Maybe the unit data is not large, so the theory that's for the large has not been in it. Or maybe the uniform tissue type incompatibility model isn't quite realistic. And here we can look at this experimentally using the side metal generator again. Um, and what we see here's for one altruist, here's for five, here's for ten altruists. On the x axis, we have the pool size getting bigger. On the y axis, we have the number of candidates matched. And we can see that indeed, as we could grow large, uh, having a longer cap doesn't help as much. But here with ten altruists, it doesn't, the advantage doesn't quite totally go away. So there's probably a little bit of the last of these good issues happening as well. So the model isn't quite realistic, but it's interesting. It says kind of what will uh, happen theoretically uh, as well. And in dynamic experiments where we look at um, things fading over time, a chain cap of four was actually the best. Better than one. Now, algorithms for the dynamic problem. So far we talked about the static problem, but in reality, you know, people coming in, people going out, <coughs> and um, one direction that the computer scientist, at least the theoretical computer scientist, would go immediately would be online algorithms with competitive ratios. So saying, okay, comparing your performance to perfect hindsight. And we showed, showed, it, is that, we showed that you can't really do that well. If we have a chain cap of L, you can't get a competitive ratio better than L is L over 2. And if you use randomization, you can do a little bit better. You get 2 minus 2 divided by L, but no better than that. Um, I'm just going to go through the proof here. So we can't really use these prior free approaches. You might say that this is pretty good. Getting half, for example, is nice. And for, as far as competitive ratios goes, it's a good one. Maybe if you're talking about swap space or something like that. But when you're talking about human lives, you don't want to lose half. So uh, we're going to have the algorithm use distributional information from the real blood distribution and the tissue type distribution in the population. And full stochastic optimization will be totally unscalable for here, so we use a different kind of approach. At each time step, we draw sample trajectories of possible futures. Uh, we're going to leverage our offline algorithm, which we talked about, to solve every trajectory. 
And then we're going to somehow aggregate in different ways, and this is where the algorithm is deeper, uh, to pick the best action that we're going to do right now. Not the whole control policy, what we're going to do into the full future, just what we're going to do this week, or this month, or whatever your cadence is. And uh, actions here are going to be cycles, not combinations of cycles, just to keep it simple. Uh, let me skip over this. There's some kind of interesting general questions of uh, uh, parameters we need to uh, deal with these kind of algorithms. Here are some results. Dummy actions help. Sometimes it's best to do nothing and the algorithm will find that out. It's better to wait. Uh, we compared three different algorithms for doing the aggregation across trajectories and it outperforms the batch approach even if we optimize for the batch approach how frequently we run the batch. And it scales to about 500 to 600 pairs. So this is not enough. We can do it at the current size, but we can't do it at the nationwide size. So, a new approach that we're taking to this, and this is actually more general than kidney exchange, the idea is that we're going to learn a potential for each type of graph element, for example, vertex, and then we're going to adjust the integer linear programming objective by subtracting out the elements that we are using up to date. So basically we try to say, what is the potential that you can get from an edge, or a vertex, whatever it is, in the future, and then we're going to subtract out that potential from the objective today. So that's a way that we can make the batch optimization cognizant about the future. And what are these, where do the weights come from? Well, we're going to use machine learning to determine them. And what are they on? Well, different versions. One is that we just weight vertices, or we can weight edges, or we can weight cycles, or the entire graph, getting more and more complex. And um, I'm not going to go through the theorem in detail. There's actually three of these theorems comparing how bad can it be to restrict attention to weighting smaller elements. So, for example, this is uh, vertex potentials versus potentials on edges of complete graphs. This is edges versus cycles of complete graphs. And then this is cycles versus complete graphs. Um, of course, the bigger the element that you weight, the more weights you have that you need to learn. So the, Experiments show that you can actually do really well by just learning weights on uh, vertices. And let me say a few words about that. Again, we use the Simon et al. generator here. We set the expiration for pairs and altruists to be realistic, so 12% survive 10 years. We have four types of altruists depending on blood type A, B, AB, or O. And then we have 16 types of patient donor pairs because the donor can have four blood types, the patient can have four, so it's four times four, sixteen. We learn the vertex potential using Paramount ILS, which is the standard technique from computer science, standard tool from computer science, and here we have each training instance with 95 pairs and five outputs arriving over 25 months. Uh, here are the results. Here we have the number of outputs in this graph, the 5% of the number of pairs. Uh, here we have the number of candidates on the x-axis, here we have on the y-axis the absolute percent improvement, which was statistically significant, but fairly small. And here you, we compare what fraction of the potential gains do we get. So here's how well we do the batch mode, here's how well we could do if we had perfect hindsight, and we asked how much of that gap do we close. And we close about 20%, 30%, and the bigger the problem, the more we close. So, uh, to recap, this is a way to include knowledge about the future into the batch optimization without increasing the complexity of the batch optimization. It's still the exact same graph, it's just that the edges have now been, edge weights have been tweaked based on knowledge about the future. Okay, uh, other people have also thought about dynamic problems in kidney exchange, but with some significant differences. In that work was all paper and pen. They were able to prove things, what are optimal policies and so on. But that also means that they had to simplify the problem so much that you could actually prove something by paper and pen. In the unsimplified real problem that we're looking at, the issue is that even the batch problem is empty complete. So you can't possibly have an analytical solution by hand. You have to have the optimizer in the loop and do this computation. 
Okay, uh, last topic before we conclude. Robustness against lasting failures. We were asking about this. So, very few people know this, but only a small number of the planned transplants go into execution. And I'm not talking about failure of the transplant itself. I'm talking about failure before the surgeon even touches the patient. Only 7% of plant transplants go into execution. Why? Well, if anything fails in your cycle, the whole cycle fails. If anything fails in your chain before you, you fail. If something fails in the chain after you, of course, it doesn't affect you anymore. Um, what can fail? Well, patients can get sick. I don't mean sick with kidney disease, they might get the flu and can't go into surgery. Uh, you might have uh, what's called a cross match failure. So you take the blood of the plant donor and plant patients, patient, you mix them up, and it cakes. Okay, medical knowledge is wrong. We thought they were compatible, they're not compatible. That cage failed, the whole cycle failed. And so only 7% succeed. Um, so what we propose here, and this is a brand new work with my student John Dickerson and colleague Ariel Popaccia, it's not even published, um, so please don't cite me on this slide. Um, you might see this next summer, hopefully. Uh, we propose to find a solution that has maximum expected weight, taking into account that ages don't just have weights, but they also have success probabilities. Okay, and now the theory changes quite a bit. First of all, the clearing problem is now MP complete, even with no chains and even with no cap on cycle length. Remember that with no chains and no cap on cycle length before it was polynomial time. Now it's MP complete just because we have probabilities. Secondly, and now this is kind of interesting random grafting that has implications for the real solver. Under a random graph model, again with the ABO blood types, uniform H probability, conditional on blood type compatibility, and not extremely high H success probability, even that there was an H. So we have now two probabilities going on in addition to the blood types. One is, is there an H in the input graph? And the other one, does the H survive if we actually try to test it? Uh, in the large, two cycles suffice with probability of one in achieving the optimal theory. So you don't need longer cycles and you don't need change. And it's computable in polynomial time. But this is again in the large, in the model, and we already see, saw that model is not always reality. And we're not always in the large, and we don't even know exactly the theory, so it doesn't say when in the large kicks in, and so forth. So we don't want to just use this type of a solution, but the cool thing we can do now, we can incorporate that as a lower bound into our prime branch and price algorithm. So we get another lower bound, and this theorem says that if things go well, the model is accurate and you're in the large, you're going to get an accurate lower bound right at the root, and you're not going to have to do any search at all. Okay, also the probabilistic approach helps prove long chains in the course over because the probability of a change starts to go down rapidly, and you don't have to consider all of the long chains, you can prune some of them away while still having full of optimality, and it is the long chains that in practice make the computational complexity high. Okay, so let me conclude. Uh, so uh, we presented an algorithm that can clear kidney exchanges optimally on a national scale. It uses an incremental formulation, so uh, we can't even write the problem down, but we can still prove optimality. It is uh, using the fraction price paradigm with a lot of generalizations to make it fast in practice. But a lot of improvements to make it fast in practice. It supports the generalizations we talked about, different cycle length and chain length caps, multiple winning donors to patient, side constraints of various forms, we didn't really talk about that. It doesn't support all side constraints, but certain types of side constraints. Um, edge weights, compatible pairs, and these never-ending altruistic donor chains that we talked about. Uh, it makes the decisions for the US, US wide kidney exchange weekly and has been used in two regional kidney exchanges as well. 
um, we talked about the dynamic problem. I touched upon two different families of algorithms for this. One is these trajectory-based online algorithms that look at possible futures, draw possible futures from the real life path distribution. So this is not some sort of online algorithm that's prior free. Um, get good solutions, but it's not really that scalable. The other idea is a general purpose idea of how we can use potentials to capture the future into the batch optimization so that we have the same optimization problem and no more complexity, but we're still cognizant about the future. Uh, both of these use distributional information and our offline algorithm, and both outperform the batch based approach, which is currently the practice, even in our uh, kidney exchange with units. Finally, I talked about robust probabilistic clearing, and while probabilistic planning is really hard in general, usually prohibitively hard, here it can actually give us some leverage to faster clearing. It allows us to prune some of the long chains away provably, and from a random graph result, we can get this uh, cool lower bounds in the large, that are tight in the large. Okay, future research. Uh, of course, even faster algorithms, things aren't ever fast enough, especially with long chains. Long chains are driving the complexity, and at the universe exchange, they would like to do infinitely long chains potentially, but uh, we started with 20, and we had to take it down to about 12, because we couldn't solve 20. So uh, the computational complexity is already curtailing what we are doing compared to what we want to do. Uh, even better online algorithms, I gave you two families, but there's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, better algorithms for dealing with cross-match failures and testing. I talked about the probabilistic approach uh, for planning, but uh, it doesn't take into account the fact that you have recourse. It's assuming that you have one plan, you execute and what failed, failed for good. But in reality, you get to move those failed guys back into the pool and do them later, try again later. So uh, more sophisticated models of that. And more sophisticated models of testing. Maybe we don't want to just do the cross match, the blood coagulation test on those edges that we plan to transplant. Maybe we're going to do more than that so we'll get more information in advance. But we can't possibly do all of them. It would be way too much, too costly, and there's not just enough blood in a person to do all of those pairwise uh, blood tests. But we could do more than just the plan ones. Which one should we do? You might even want to have contingency plan snippets. You can't do complete contingency planning, but you might have contingency plan snippets, like if this fails, then I'm going to do that thing next, and so on. Machine learning to predict cross-match failures. We're already working on, or have built a more sophisticated instant generator than the Sidemann et al. generator. It has a lot more functionality, and we can get better predictions. But the, uh, there's a lot to do here as well, to try to predict the cross-match failures, so you can actually do better virtual cross-matching to get robust planning without having to pay for and draw the blood tests from the actual people and so on. Centers incentives to reveal pairs. So this is something that we didn't touch upon yet, but there are other papers that others have done on this. Uh, unfortunately, not all of the centers reveal all of their patients to the exchange. There are two main reasons. One is that the surgeons see that it's logistically easier to transplant the donors and the patients in their local transplant center first, uh, and then they only put the hard to match cases, the ones that didn't match into the UNAS pool. But that's really bad, it compromises the overall efficiency of the system. The other reason why they do this is that it's monitoring. The transplant centers get paid for the operations that they would rather do it themselves than give it to some other transplant center. So uh, there's, uh, there's very interesting game mechanism design issues how to incentivize everybody to reveal all of the possible pairs, and there are impossibility results. You can't actually do this with mechanism design. So one option would be to mandate. If the, a lawmaker would say that everybody has to go in the UNESCO pool, that would be great. But at least in the U, and this is by the way what they do in Canada. But in the US, that's politically not the climate. So we need some sort of middle ground, maybe with constraint generation in the solver, but it's, it's not just constraint generation on the revealed pairs, it's also constraint generation on all possible hypothe hypothetical pairs that the centers didn't reveal, and there's infinitely many, so we can't generate all of those constraints. 
Matching cadence. We run once a week. We used to run once a month, we run now once a week. There are private exchanges in the US that run multiple times a day. Running too often is not good because you're going to just greedily, you're going to revert to a greedy algorithm uh, in, the, uh, in the actual online world. So it's good to wait some amount to batch the uh, pool, get some liquidity in the pool, and then you have something to optimize with. But if you have multiple exchanges and you have people listing with many of them, you get a race to the bottom, where those exchanges that are running at a faster cadence will deplete all the matches, and those exchanges that are trying to optimize better overall do not get any matches. So this is a big problem. Um, finally, liver and cross organ exchanges. There has been one liver cycle that has been executed in Korea. There's no liver exchange. We have a paper pending on simulations on liver exchange, and actually, and our simulator actually supports any organs. So uh, liver is actually different in that you don't have to worry about the HLA compatibility as much. So from a computational perspective, it's easier than the Of course, from a surgical perspective, cutting a liver in half and taking a low out and transplanting it, it's riskier both for the donor and the patient than a kidney. But uh, it, it's conceivable that you could set up a liver exchange, and there is a lot of light donation of liver already. You could also do cross organ. Like, okay, you give me a kidney, uh, and I'll give you a liver. Or my, my, my donor is going to give you a liver. And so on. We have in that paper, we have simulations of this cross organ exchange between liver and kidney. Um, I, I would have thought that at that point it becomes easier to say, you give me your kidney, I give you money. Well, it's always easier. Money is always <laughs> easier. <laughs> but but it's, uh, most people would say that that's as a lot of Well, why can't you use a kidney to buy a kidney and not money? So, uh, uh, Alroth has this paper called Repugnancy in Markets. So, it's just there are certain things in markets that are considered repugnant, that are just out. And it seems that in transplantation, most people in most countries think that money is out. Iran doesn't think so. They had a big, big black market, and because of that, they changed to make it official and safer. They allowed it. And there are people like Gary Becker, a famous economist, Nobel Prize winning economist in the US, who would argue that we should just auction this stuff for money. Uh, but that's not the majority. Most people think that's repugnant. Uh, so organ for organ, even if it's a different organ, it's okay. But some, uh, organ for money is not okay. And I, I kind of see that. There, there are good arguments for that. But I, I want to be agnostic to that. My talk doesn't hinge on that. We start from the point that, okay, money is not legal. Yeah. So that's our starting point. But we can still do kidneys, we can do livers, we can do livers for kidneys and so on. And I give my son's kidney also. What? Can I donate my son's kidney? Yeah, can you it's donate your son's kidney? kidney? So in the US, you can't do minors oh. as donors. You can do minors as recipients, and actually minors in our exchange get preference. Because having a bad kidney is going to stunt your growth. So young people actually do get preference in the weights. Um, finally, where's the limit? What's okay? We talked about money, whether that's okay. But what about, uh, should you be able to give your life for your son to get a kidney? What about the heart? Thank you. So thank you for the very interesting presentation. Uh, from, uh, we are slightly late, uh, but I think we can have still more a lot more questions. Yeah. But it's Fine. What is the practical benefit? I mean, how do you measure benefits of improvements and numbers of uh, uh, how, do you, how do you measure it? Yeah, so um, from a scientific perspective, we can measure the algorithms against prior algorithms. And it's all about speed in the batch case, and it's about uh, uh, simulated life safe in the online case. In, in the reality, it's kind of hard to say, as it is always, because we don't know what the, what the counterfactual would be. If we had not invented the algorithm that can do this at a nationwide scale, what would have happened? Would you not have set up an exchange? Would somebody else have invented an algorithm that can do it? Would they have continued manual matching and done a decent job? How decent? So it's hard to know what the counterfactual would have been, so we can't really say. 
But you have you have not have compared the what they're doing manually, for example. But then you run your machine in the in the sh shadow and then say that you should have done this. And how would you have compared? You no, know, that's a, that's an amazing thing. We never had to do that. And you might think that the surgeons would have stood back and said, "Okay, well, we know how to match kidneys. Oh yeah, you get to be a shadow show over. We'll listen to you a little bit about your solutions, but we are going to make the decisions." Never. Right away, Michael Reese, uh, who was running ATE, is a real visionary, and he was open to all of these ideas. He didn't know any optimization, and I just gave a bunch of ideas to him, and he had a bunch of ideas, and his attitude was always, well, let's test it out. Never was it like, oh, we can't do it because that's not how we do it. And with Yunus, from day one in the Yunus exchange, our algorithm has made the decisions. There has been no human in the loop ever. But they're not interested to know how badly they would have done it themselves. Well, I'm interested, but it's impossible to know. So I can't roll back, back to the world and say, okay, let's not tell them about our algorithm and see what happens. But you could, you could ask if, they, uh, if you knew what their uh, blueprint for making decisions was. You could yeah. run from yeah. So, so one thing we, we can do, and this is actually something that Al Roth had done in a simulation paper before us with his students, uh, is that how much of a lift do you get by allowing three cycles? compared to just doing a polynomial elements algorithm that, for example, Johns Hopkins Exchange was using. And they showed that you get a significant lift by going to three cycles. So that type of thing you can do, and you can say, look, okay, the humans would definitely not have done as well as the best two cycle solution. So you get at least that much, but you don't know exactly how much. But the, the difference is, do you measure it in terms of, say, years of uh, life, or well, how do you measure this <laughs> The number of kidneys is sort of still the same, so... Would there be kidneys left uh, unused uh, in normal systems? Oh, without an exchange at all? Well, somewhere we'll be able to compare something. <laughs> yeah, we haven't really done those much. It was more before the real kidney exchanges like this were fielded, uh, we compared it, what if we do two cycles only versus this? That type of stuff. And we knew that the humans do worse than just two cycles. And uh, it, 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 the adoption question wasn't that, okay, how much better is it? It was more like, oh, it's better, we are adopting. But that, that, that's an interesting question. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, very stupid question, but uh, at least I understand that this cross organ exchange cannot work like, you give me a kidney, I give you a brain or something like that. That should be completely out of the question. So well, that's my question. Yeah, my yeah. final question is, where does the boundary go? If you believe in the Hippocratian oath in a strict sense, you might say that nobody should donate an organ, because it's, at least with some probability, it's bad for them. Like you're running around with one kidney, you get into a car accident, and that kidney gets pierced, now you have none. Would have been nice if you had had the other one. But that's with some low probability, things can happen. So with a kidney, it seems okay. With liver, it, it's a little bit harder to donate. Now you have a single digit death probability, right at operation. Uh, we are with an eyeball, well, your quality of life is much lower. With a heart or brain, you're dead right, of, right, right out of the gate. But who gets to decide that? If, if you, you know, for example, if you're striking a trade off that you have a 13 year old kid, you want to have them live a long time. You're 60. Would you be, al be allowed to give your life so they can live? I don't know what the answer is, but that's a, it's not obvious. And just another stupid question, a person wants to become extra intelligent, he sees the opposite guy doing something brilliant, he is jealous of him, he wants his brain. That's not allowed, that's wrong. I mean, in a sense, he wants his, I mean, uh, I'm just trying to put across I that. Don't I, 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 don't, I, I, I want to stay from, away from making a statement what's wrong or what's right, I just want to raise the question. Other questions? How many matches are generated every week? How many matches every week? Okay, so that increases over time. Remember that in October 2010, we have nobody in the pool. Today we have um, over 120 transplant centers in the pool. So uh, that number keeps changing, but typically when we look at the uh, uh, solution, we see, I want to say, like two or three cycles of change per match. <laughs> The rest of it online because we want to give a little bit of chance to people to look at the heat uh, session. So let's thank Thomas again.